I would like to address a subject this evening that I think is, is a very important subject, and it's one that is almost totally misunderstood by the religious world. The Catholics don't understand this, this subject. Uh, the Protestants don't understand this subject. The Jews don't understand this subject. The Jews of Christ's day, the religious leadership, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, totally did not understand this subject. The professing Christian world does not understand this subject. And, you know, even some uh, of God's own, uh, some of God's people do not understand this subject uh, as clearly as we ought, because it is a very important subject, it is a fundamental subject, uh, and it is yet one uh, that uh, there has been a great deal of confusion about over the years and over the centuries. Uh, there was confusion about it in the days of Christ, and there's confusion about it in our time and in our day. And the specific subject that I have reference to is, what is the spirit of the law? What is the spirit of the law? Now, to the average Protestant, the spirit of the law means that, well, the law is sort of spiritualized away. Well, we don't have to really do what it says, you see. We don't have to keep the letter. We just have to sort of have a good attitude. Well, is that all that the spirit of the law means? Does the spirit of the law sort of spiritualize away the law? Now, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, on the other hand, they did not understand the spirit of the law. You know, that was some of the, the strongest words that Christ had with anybody was with this group of religious leaders because they fundamentally did not understand the spirit of the law. Now, let's pick up the subject in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul addresses the subject, and I think we will see that there is something very important and very fundamental, and yet when you look at it, a very simple, clear subject. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll pick it up in verse 6. Paul says, speaking of God, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, what does that mean? The letter kills, and the Spirit gives life. Well, brethren, as we're going to see in just a moment, and I want to just give you a little bit of general explanation, and we're going to go through it verse by verse. What is the purpose of the law? Paul define, tells us in Romans that the law defines sin. Paul says in the book of Romans that except for the law, I would not know sin. You see in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, where did thou shalt not covet come from? You all know that's, that's part of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Paul quoted one of the Ten Commandments and he said, the law defines sin. He said, take for an example, I wouldn't know that there was anything wrong with having lust except the law said, thou shalt not covet. So the law defines sin. That's the purpose of the law. The law tells us what sin is. It defines what is appropriate and inappropriate conduct. It defines what is and is not pleasing to God. The law defines sin. Wouldn't know sin except for the law. You drive down the road, if there's, no, if there's no speed limit posted, you wouldn't know what it was. You don't know unless there is a law, unless something is clearly stated. Now, what happens? The law defines sin, and the law explains that there is a penalty for sin. You see, the wages of sin is death. The law spells out what sin is and what the consequences for sin is. The letter of the law, if you just take exactly what is said, the letter kills. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The law spells out, the letter of the law spells out sin. It spells out what is sin, and it spells out the consequences of sin, and it results in death, because the wages of sin is death. Now, the Spirit gives life. You see, the law has defined sin and has defined the consequences of sin. The Spirit, the Spirit, can, you can take it in, in, in two ways here. The Spirit of God does what? It opens our mind, it convicts us of sin, 
It is the means by which we are moved to repentance and drawn to God. It makes possible our forgiveness. Now, when you look at the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, as we're going to see as we go through this, the spirit is used in the scriptures, the term spirit is used to to refer to the enlivening, to the motivating, the animating quality of something. You can go back in the book of Genesis and you read that God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he breathed into Adam the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. Now, if you look up that word, uh, you can go back and you can look it up in Strong's. If you look up, he breathed, into his no, his, his, he breathed into Adam the breath of life, you find that that word for breath is the same word that's normally translated spirit. It can be rendered spirit or breath. It was that enlivening quality. God had made Adam. He was, he was lying there. He was perfectly formed, perfectly shaped. Uh, he was exactly what God had made, but he wasn't alive. And God breathed. God put life into him. And Adam became a living soul. That spirit of life, that spark of life, that breath of life that came into Adam. The spirit of the law is that enlivening, that animating quality, that, that which gives life to the law, which makes it living, that the principle, the, 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 the enlivening principle that underlies the whole point of the law. You see, we have been made not simply ministers of the letter, not simply, we're not here simply to define sin and to carry out the penalty for, for sin, for breaking the law. But we are to administer the Spirit, to explain the Spirit of the law, and to point the way toward God's Spirit. The Spirit gives life. You see, if the administration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of spirit be rather glorious? Now, you can go back and read the story in Exodus 34. You remember Moses went up the mountain in the presence of God to receive the Ten Commandments. He was up there 40 days. He fasted. He was in the presence of God. And when he came back down the mountain, you can read it in Exodus chapter 34, he came down the mountain and his face glowed. He radiated. He had been in the presence of God and he had, as it were, absorbed a little bit of the glory. Well, it was a frightening thing when the people saw it, scared them. And when Moses realized the situation, he put a veil over his face. And the only time he took it off was when he went into the tabernacle to pray. And over a period of weeks, the Bible doesn't define exactly how long, that glory, that radiance, gradually faded away. And Moses' face resumed a normal appearance. So Paul makes reference to that. He said, you know, Moses was in the presence of God. The law, the letter of the law, had a glory to it, but it was not a permanent glory. Now he said, the administration of the Spirit will be even more glorious. If the administration, verse 9, of condemnation be glory, how uh, how much more does the administration of righteousness exceed in glory? You see, the letter of the law could only administer the death penalty because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the administration of the Spirit has to do with a transformation that produces righteousness. You see, that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. If that which is done away was glorious, what was done away? the administration of death. Now, some think that the law was done away. We're going to see that that's not so at all. No, the law was made more binding. If that which was done away was glorious, that was the administration of death, that which remains is more glorious. Seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. The children of Israel could not look to the end of that which is abolished. Their minds were blinded. For until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is taken away in Christ. You see, they really don't get the point. They don't see what's really behind it. Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall, when they 
it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Jesus Christ came and personified the law. He was the personification of the law. He lived the law. He set us an example that we should follow in His steps. And we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Step by step, we are to be changed and transformed to reflect the very glory of Jesus Christ. Now, we find something that is laid out here. and It talks about the Spirit of the Law and the letter of the Law. And it talks about that which, was, uh, that, that which was done away and that which remains. Now, let's go briefly back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, in verse 6. Now we are delivered from the law. Okay, you know, let's just close the book and all go home. We're delivered from the law. Is that, is that what that means? Well, you know, one key to understanding the Scripture is you read it in context. We are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I hadn't known sin, but by the law I hadn't known lust, except the law said you shall not covet. No, Paul goes on and tells us in verse 12, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. Verse 14, he tells us the law is spiritual. I'm carnal. Why would God want to do away with what's spiritual and keep what's carnal? That doesn't make any sense. The law is holy and just and good. You know, people think, well, God's going to get rid of that old law, you know, that old law. Well, God says here, inspired Paul to say that it's holy and just and good. Paul says in, in uh, Romans 3.31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Oh, no, you know, Paul's not talking about abolishing the law. He's talking about getting out from under the penalty that the law exacts. We're delivered from the law. You see, the law holds out a death penalty. The law defines sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And so that means that you and I, every one of us here, we're all, on the basis of that, we'd all be in a heap of trouble. Be in a lot of trouble. So we're delivered from the penalty that the law exacts. We're, that being dead wherein we were held, you see, that's what, why we need deliverance, is because we were under the death sentence. We were on death row. We were on death row. We were waiting to be taken out, to be executed, to be burned. We were dead wherein we were held. But now, you see, we have an opportunity to serve in the newness of spirit. We have a new start. We have a fresh start and a chance to serve in newness of spirit. Let's go back to Hebrews 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We find... Here, speaking in Hebrews 8, talking about the Old and New Covenants, talking about Jesus Christ and Moses. You see, Moses, in verse 5 of Hebrews 8, was admonished that he should, when he was about to make the tabernacle, to make it according to the pattern showed him in the wilderness. But now has he, Christ, verse 6, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. So there was a fault with the Old Covenant. Was the fault with the law? Was the fault with God? No. Verse 8, for finding fault with them. He says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people." Now, brethren, you show me one thing here in Hebrews 8 that says anything about God getting rid of the law, about God doing away with the law, about God uh, saying, well, you know, the law I gave them under that, that old law and that old covenant, that was bad. I'm going to give them a new law for a new covenant. Well, God didn't say anything about changing the law because, you see, the law is the law is from the beginning. The law is from everlasting. The law is spiritual. That's what we're told. The law is spiritual. We're told that, that 
in, in verse 40, in, in Psalm 119, verse 144, the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. You see, the righteousness of the law of God is eternal. The righteousness of the law of God was not from Moses to Christ. The righteousness of the law of God is eternal. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. See, we're told in verse 142 of Psalm 119, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. Verse 151, You are near, O eternal, and all your commandments are truth concerning your testimonies. This is verse 152, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Now, where in the world does somebody come off with the idea that, that the law of God was temporary and, and God came up with a different law? He didn't say anything about a different law in Hebrews 8. He said, I'm going to take the law. The difference is, under the Old Covenant, the law of God was written with the finger of God and tables of stone. Under the New Covenant, the law of God is written with the Spirit of God in the hearts and minds of individuals. God says, I'm going to internalize it. I'm going to write my laws into their hearts and into their minds. They'll be to me a people, and I'll be to them a God. We go back and read in Hebrews 8, the, the distinction between the Old and the New Covenant was the Old Covenant did not have promises that were as wonderful and as great as under the New Covenant. The New Covenant was established upon better promises. What promise is the New Covenant established upon? It's established upon the promise of the Spirit of God. You go back and read in Exodus 20 and show me where God promised them His Spirit. God promised them physical blessings for physical obedience. Under the New Covenant, God offers us His Spirit to inscribe His law in our hearts and in our minds. And He offers us that Spirit, which is the earnest of eternal life. So you can go through, and there are many places that you can, uh, uh, that you can go to make plain the fact that God's basic law is forever. God's law stands. You see, God has God's law, the, the basic law of God, the God's basic spiritual law summed up in the Ten Commandments is forever. The Ten Commandments were the basis of the Old Covenant. Ten Commandments were the basis of the Old Covenant. And I, I want to just show you this as an aside, because I, I really want to get into the spirit of the law, but I, I need to set the stage a little bit. Um, in, in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3, you know, we're told in Galatians 3.10 that as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, what does that mean? Well, it says... What's written is, Cursed is every one that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, the works of the law, when you, when you go back and read it, and, and uh, there's going to be an article on that, not in the coming global news, but in the following one. The works of the law had to do specifically with the ceremonial aspects that all had to do with making an atonement for sin, with 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 the restoration of cleanness and purity and good standing in the eyes of God. Now, the reason that those who are of the works of the law are under the curse is because the only reason you had to go and perform uh, some of these ritualistic washings or to offer some of these sacrifices, were the only reason you would do that was because you had become unclean, because you had sinned. To go and to carry out the ritual was to acknowledge yourself as being unclean, as being a sinner, and as being in need of being clean. Now, the blood of bulls and goats can't wash away sin. All the water and the scrubbing of the hands in the world cannot wash away a defiled conscience. So the point is, if you're having to perform the works of the law, you're under a curse. The curse comes when you sin. You see, you're cursed if you don't continue in all the things that are written in the book of the law. If you sin, you're in trouble. And there's got to be a way out from under that trouble, and that's what God made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see, verse 13 of Romans 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. 
For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. The curse isn't that you have to keep the law. The curse isn't keeping the Sabbath or the holy days. The curse is being taken out and hanged. The curse is being executed. That's the curse of the law. And it's plain. It's right here. All somebody's got to do is read it. Absolutely incredible. Now, let's go to verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of man, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls or adds thereto. If you've got a contract and you sign it and it's notarized, somebody can't come along and stick a P.S. down below your signature and stick in all sorts of other stipulations that you never agreed to. That's what Paul's saying. He said, that doesn't make sense. So he said, anything that was added after the covenant was not a part of the covenant. Now, brethren, Go back. Go back to Exodus. All you've got to do is just, just flip through. God proposed the covenant in Exodus 19. People said, all the Lord has said we'll do. God spoke the words of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Then Moses, in, verses 20, in chapters 21, 22, and 23, gave them the statutes and the judgments that applied... The Ten Commandments, the principles of the Ten Commandments to a physical carnal nation. You find that the key operative word in Exodus 21, 22, and 23 is the little two-letter word, if. If a man shall do thus and such, then you do this. If a man do such and such, then you do this. If such and such happens. You know, if a man steal an ox, if a thief be found breaking, if a man entice a maid, if you lend money to any of your people, if a man come presumptuously, if, just go through the whole thing. You see, it, Exodus 21, 22, and 23 applied the principles of the Ten Commandments to a people that did not have a heart to obey. That's the letter of the law. The Ten Commandments were the basis of the covenant, though, because you find that that is what was, that that was what was to be put in there that that was the, the basis of the covenant over and over. We see, uh, we see that. Now, you come on back, and Moses went up into the mountain, and he received instructions for the tabernacle, and God would dwell among them. Well, you come on down, and in, ver in chapter 32, in chapter 32 of the book of Exodus, you find Moses coming down the mountain. Well, what you find is they built the golden calf. That was 40 days after Moses had gone up into the mountain. Been in the mountain 40 days. In other words, they didn't last six weeks. Within six weeks of the time, they had said, All that the Lord has said, we will do. Because you see, that's what they said, and the covenant was confirmed. Exodus 24 7, Moses took the book of the covenant, read it in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. He took the blood of the covenant in verse 8 and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant. So the covenant was finished by Exodus 24. The covenant was finished. But when Moses came down 40 days later, less than six weeks, there, there was an orgy going on down there. You know, we were told the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They didn't sit down and have a hamburger and a Coke and get up and play volleyball either. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, you go through and you read the story. You know, they were drunk. They were naked. There was just a wild orgy going on. Well, Moses smashed the tables of stone, symbolizing the fact that the people had shattered the covenant that they had made. They hadn't lasted six weeks. You know, broke the golden calf. You remember the story. He said, who's on the Lord's side? The Levites came over where he was, and they lined up with him. He sent them out to execute the ringleaders, went back up the mountain, came back down, and you know what you come to next? The book of Leviticus. And you know how Leviticus opens up? Leviticus means to the Levites. And you know what Leviticus contains? Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. The sacrifices. All of the sacrificial system which had not been given to begin with. The whole sacrificial system was not part of the covenant, was it? The whole sacrificial system was not part of the covenant. God, had said, God specifically said that, that... Uh, uh, you know, when I brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, you know, I did not, com I, I didn't command them uh, concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. You know, but this is what I told them: uh, to obey my voice, to keep my commandments, a and that's what God had instructed, and uh, uh, that's what God had in mind for Israel to do. 
But we find that they didn't continue. That's in, you'll find that in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 22. I spoke not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. This thing commanded I them, obey my voice. But you see, they did So when we find in Galatians, when we find in Galatians, back to chapter 3, we find that anything, even with a man's covenant, anything added afterward can't, is not really part of the covenant. You see, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And we find that, verse 17, the covenant that was command, confirmed before of God in Christ, the law that was 430 years afterward cannot disannul or make the promise of non-effect. Wherefore serves that law? Verse 19, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. What law was only to last until Christ? The law that was added until the seed should come. The law that was added because of transgressions. Now, if there hadn't been some law, there never would have been any transgression, would there? Can you have transgression without law? I remember years ago, uh, sure Mr. Prater uh, does as well, maybe others of you, but I, I remember years ago, first time I made a trip across the great American Northwest, went across Montana. In those days, Montana had no speed limit. There was no speed limit in the day. You couldn't break the speed limit in Montana in the daytime. They had a night speed limit, but, you know, you were going 100 miles an hour. There wasn't anybody sitting out there to give you a ticket for it. There was no speed limit. That was, that, that was simply the way it was. Now, uh, you see, that, is, that is, uh, 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 is, is made clear, and Paul even explains that in, in, in the book of Romans. Uh, the fact that uh, in Romans chapter 5, where Paul says that uh, uh, in verse 13, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. If there is no law, there is no sin. You can't have sin as the transgression of the law. If you don't have law, you don't have sin. So Galatians 3 says there was a law that was transgressed and there was another law that was added because of that transgression. It was added to last until Christ. Now, brethren, you don't have to speak a whole lot of Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin, and, and uh, uh, whatever else to figure that out. All you've got to do is go to a few verses. Because, you see, Genesis tells us, in Gen all the way back in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So the commandments were in effect when Abraham was on earth. You come forward to uh, the book of Exodus, and in chapter 16, you read about the, come, the manna and the Sabbath, and you find in, in uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 27, that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, and they didn't find any manna. In verse 28, the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my, and my laws? Now, wait a minute. We hadn't gotten to Exodus 20 yet. The people hadn't made the covenant. They didn't confirm the covenant until Exodus 24. But he was already talking about the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 16 and said, How long refuse you to keep my Sabbaths, my commandments? The law was in effect. The Ten Commandments were in effect from the beginning because Psalm 119 said that God's law is everlasting. It is from everlasting. It's from eternity. Oh, yes, there was a law that was added. There was a temporary law. There was a law that was added because of disobedience. That was the Levitical laws, the ceremonial laws that involved how do you gain access to the holy God. Those were the things that stood only in the food offerings, the drink offerings, the various washings, and the physical rituals. Spelled out in the book of Hebrews, only four things, four aspects of what was added. Let's back and uh, give you a reference on that. That would be back in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verse 10, or Hebrews 9, verse 10. You see, this Hebrews 9, 9 says, This was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. See, these things stood only in the food offerings and the drink offerings, the various washings and the physical rituals that were imposed on them until the time of Reformation. 
You see, the blood of bulls and goats, verse 12, is not going to solve the problem. Christ didn't enter in by that. He entered in by His own blood. He offered Himself without spot to God to purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God, down in Hebrews 9.14. So the point is that the law that was added, as, as we're told in Galatians chapter 3, the law that was added because of transgressions was not the Ten Commandments. It was not the Sabbath. It was not the Holy Days. It was not clean and unclean meats. The law that was added because of transgressions was the whole Levitical sacrificial system. And all you have to do is just go right through the context of the book of Exodus. And you see, that was not a part of the Old Covenant. That was not part of the Old Covenant because if it's added afterward, it's not part of the Covenant. No, the Old Covenant was based on the Ten Commandments. But you see, the, the key is that God is after more than just physical obedience. God is after our learning the spirit of the law. The difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is not that the Old Covenant was based on the Ten Commandments and the New Covenant is based on some vague law of love. No, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant were both based upon the Ten Commandments. Under the Old Covenant, the law of God was written with the finger of God on tables of stone. Under the New Covenant, the law of God, same law, is written in our hearts and in our minds through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let's go on. The Pharisees did not understand the spirit of the law. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5 because we looked earlier. The Ten Commandments, the basis of the law, spelled out in Exodus 20. Exodus 21, 22, and 23 were the statutes and judgments which amplified the principles of the Ten Commandments as they were to be applied in the letter of the law to a physical people, to a carnal nation that did not have a heart to obey. And so they continually address the subject of if a man do this, then you do that. And it spelled out penalties. Now, let's go to Matthew 5 because what we're going to find is that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 corresponds to Exodus 21, 22, and 23. The Ten Commandments stand the same. But Exodus 21, 22, and 23 spells out the letter of the law. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 spells out the spirit of the law. And it's the same law we're talking about. It's the Ten Commandments, which sum up the basic law of God. God is love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the first and great commandment. The second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. On these two, these two principles, the first four commandments tell you how to love God with your whole heart. The last six tell you how to love your neighbor as yourself. Exodus 21, 22, and 23 apply the principles in an Old Covenant context, apply the principles in terms of the letter of the law. If a man does this, then you do that. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is addressed to those with whom Christ was making a new covenant. And he tells them in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And people say, oh, well, that, must mean, that word fulfill must mean destroy must mean he did away with it. must mean it's over with. And so then you'd read, don't think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but I'm come to get rid of it. And that would be a real smart saying, wouldn't it? Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I want to show you something. You know, sometimes one of the ways to know what a word means is look at how it's used in context. The word that's translated fulfill here is the Greek word player. Uh, 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 plero, uh, plero, uh, plero in the Greek means to fill up to the full. Let's go on back to Matthew chapter 13 in verse 48. I'll show you another place that same word is used. It's talking about the kingdom in verse 47 of Matthew 13 being like a net cast into the sea, gathered of every kind which when it was full, verse 48, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and cast the bad away. Verse 48, 
when it was full, that word plero, same exact word that's used back here in Matthew 5.17 is fulfilled. If you've got a net full of fish, that doesn't mean the net's finished. That doesn't mean you've thrown it away. That doesn't mean it's empty. That doesn't mean you've taken it out and burned it. It means it's filled up. The word that's translated fulfill here is used as, as the word full back here in, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 48. Let's go on back a little further. Let's, let's uh, not just take, uh, uh, let's uh, mouth the two or three witnesses we'll establish a thing. Let's go back to Luke 2. Luke 2 verse 40. He said unto them, How is it that... Uh, let's pick it up in verse 40 here. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The word filled here, same word as translated fulfill in Matthew 5, 17. He was filled with wisdom. Did that mean he didn't have any? It means he was filled up to the full. He was absolutely filled with it. Well, let's go one other place. Let's look in Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. In verse 19, And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the same word as translated fulfilled. So when Christ said, Don't think I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I've come to fill it up to the full. I've come to maximize it. I've come to give you the absolute, full, complete meaning. You see, truly I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, till it be filled up. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty serious. Didn't even say he was going to be there. Just said he'd be called the least by those that are. Shall keep, shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, maybe Christ didn't understand that the law was to be done away. Verse 20, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, how is our righteousness to exceed theirs? This is Matthew 5.20. How is our righteousness to exceed theirs? Well, you see, we are to obey the law in the Spirit, not simply in the letter. To obey the Spirit of the law. The Spirit of the law doesn't spiritualize away the law. It doesn't do away with the law. It doesn't undermine the law. The Spirit of the law is that enlivening principle that gets down to what the law is all about. Now, Jesus Christ, in the rest of Matthew 5, Jesus Christ defines what the Spirit of the law is, and He gives us six illustrations. He starts out, and He takes two of the Ten Commandments, and He expounds and amplifies and gives the Spirit of the law. Then He takes four statutes, and He gives the Spirit of the law. Verse 21, first case. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill. Now, where did you hear that? Exodus 20, he's quoting right out of the Ten Commandments. You've heard, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill, you shall not murder. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, did he say, now it's okay to kill as long as you have a good attitude? No, he said, I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, which means just an expression of absolute contempt, shall be in danger of the, of the council. But whosoever shall say, you fool, which again was an expression of absolute worthlessness and contempt. You're saying, look, you have no value. Now, brethren, the whole basis of the value of human life is that we're human beings made in the image of God. And we have the potential to ultimately be born into the family of God to say to someone that they are of no value is to basically say, look, if I weren't afraid of getting in trouble, I'd just blow you away and save the oxygen you're breathing. Now, you know, a lot of times people don't carry out the act because they're scared of getting in trouble. They don't want to go to, uh, you know, where we send them here, up to Huntsville here in Texas. You know, they don't want to go to Angola and Louisiana. They don't, they, don't want to, they don't want to get in trouble. But you see, he said, if you say this in your heart, you say, you fool, you shall be in danger of hell fire. 
You bring your gift to the altar, and there remember your brother has aught against you. Leave there your gift before the altar. Go your way. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way. Now, the point is, Christ gave the spirit of the law. He said the letter of the law says don't kill. Now, if you go through your life and you've never picked up a gun, blown somebody away, is that all God's after? I mean, you may have cursed the guy blue and called him every vile name in the book. You may have shook your, your fist in his face and said, you know, I, I wish you were dead. Maybe you just beat him half to death, but he didn't die. You know, he recovered, so you didn't kill. It says, don't kill. I kept the letter of the law. You know, that guy's laying there, but the paramedics got to him before he bled to death. So I, obviously, I didn't kill. God's certainly pleased with me. <laughs> Is that all God's after? That's the letter of the law. Don't kill. Christ said, look, that's what was said. Don't kill. But what do you think God's really after? He wants you to have an attitude of love and respect for every human being. That's the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law didn't undermine the letter. It didn't do away with the letter. You can't break the letter and keep the spirit. The spirit of the law goes way beyond. You see, the Pharisees, they said, well, I didn't kill. I paid this guy and he killed. Uh, you remember the story, you know? They they bribed uh, they bribed Judas and they uh, hired false witness. They don't, but they didn't they didn't do it. The Romans did it. They delivered him to Pilate, and they wouldn't even go into the to the judgment hall where Pilate was because they didn't want to be defiled. They hadn't eaten the Passover yet. They were keeping the letter of the law. Christ said, if you don't, if your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, you're not even going to be there. Now, your righteousness can't exceed theirs by saying, well, I won't even keep the Passover. You know, I won't even keep the Sabbath. I won't even obey the law. Your righteousness sure doesn't exceed theirs then. No. Christ said, look, let me give you an illustration. You've heard, don't kill. I'm telling you that it's insufficient just to go through life and refrain from lopping somebody's head off or stabbing them through the midsection. You've got to have an attitude of respect. You can't have this, this attitude, this spirit of murder. Now he goes right on. Verse 27 takes, takes another commandment, takes the seventh commandment. He says, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, You shall not commit adultery. Another direct quotation right out of the Ten Commandments. Verse 28, I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. The spirit of the law is I want you to have an attitude of faithfulness. It's not a matter of just going almost all the way and stopping. I want you to have an attitude of faithfulness, the spirit of the law. You see, the spirit of the law doesn't mean you get right up to the edge and you lean over as far as you can and you stop just before you fall. How far can you lean over the cliff without falling? The only way I know to find out is lean over far enough to fall, and on the way down you know when you should have stopped. <laughs> but you know, it's a little bit late. By that time, you're going to go splat when you hit the bottom. So, the, the spirit of the law is the principle. That's what God's after. Brethren, if we're going to be in the kingdom of God and the family of God, God wants us to learn to think like He thinks. That's what it means to have the law written in our hearts and in our minds. That's not some vague, ethereal, spiritualized away a sort of fluff fluff. God says, look, if you're going to be in my family, if you're going to be administering my government for eternity, you need to know how I think. You need to understand. You need to have my mind. You need to think like I think. I'm going to write my laws in your heart. I'm going to put them in there. I'm going to help you to have them indelibly impressed in your mind. So Christ amplified. He said, now let's take a couple of the commandments. Let's understand the spirit of the law. He comes on down in verse, in, in verse 31, and he says, Now it has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now he's quoting here from Deuteronomy 24, one of the statutes, regulating divorce. He said, now let me ask you something. Do you think that all the law is after is just make sure you do it according to the book? Just make sure you got all the forms filled out and, the, and, the, and the, that you've signed in all the right places and got the I's dotted and the T's crossed. That's all God's after. Whosoever shall put away his wife, make sure you give him a writing of divorcement. Make sure it's all legal. You think that's all God's after? No. I say unto you, verse 32, whosoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication, of immorality, of porneia, 
causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her uh, that is divorced commits adultery. Now, Christ said, look, what's the spirit of the law? What's God after? God's after faithfulness. He's after commitment. Go back to the beginning. You remember Christ was quizzed in one place. Uh, well, you know, uh, what uh, can a man put away his wife for any cause, he was asked. There were two schools of thought among the Jews, the, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. And they had great disputes about the law. And they had disputes in terms of exactly what this meant technically and what that meant technically. And they had arguments about Deuteronomy 24 and the meaning of this word in the Hebrew. Because if you go back and look at it in, in, in the English translation, it says uh, that uh, you know if a man finds uh, uncleanness, well, what does that mean? That's the way it's translated in the English. Uh, it's a little vague, and the Hebrew is just as vague. It was vague enough that they argued about it, and they, they disputed about it, and they tried to drag Christ into the argument. And they wanted Him to split hairs. Now, exactly why, what, unclean, what do you mean uncleanness? See, one group sort of taught... They, they were very liberal. I mean, anything from burning the toast on was, you know, that was bad enough. Uh, and, and the others were a little stricter. And if you go back and you read the account, Christ didn't get tangled up in their arguments and harangue about the words. He said, look... Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, allowed something. He allowed this. But from the beginning it was not so. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? You know, that ought to tell us something. I mean, if you want to know how many wives God thought a man ought to have, how many did you make for Adam? You know, he didn't make uh, Adam and Steve. Uh, he made Adam and Eve. That ought to tell us something, too. He didn't make one man and a whole bunch of women, and he didn't make one woman and a whole bunch of men. He made one man and one woman. They were sort of stuck with each other, weren't they? Now, Christ went back and he quoted from the law. Now, let me explain something here. You see, part of the fundamental misunderstanding that a lot of people have with the spirit of the law is they don't understand what the law is. See, to a lot of people, law is a list of rules. Well, if you can't show me where it says, Thou shalt not, then I'm going to do it. If you can't show me where it says, Thou shalt do such and such, well, then I'm not going to do that. Brethren, that misses the point. God didn't just give a list of 999 rules. Thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Just, just a whole list of rules, you know. You flip it through. Oh, okay, this is rule 439. God gave Ten Commandments, and God did give rules. He gave... But that's only one aspect of the law. You know, another aspect of the law is testimonies. Commandments, statutes, judgments, testimonies, precepts. You know what most of the Old Testament is? Most of it's testimonies. You know what the word testimony means? It means the same thing it means in English. Testimony is, is, is somebody's witness to count. If somebody is giving testimony, they're having to testify. They got called into court. What are they telling? They're telling what they know of that happened. They're describing an incident. The testimonies of God are descriptions of incidents. They're descriptions of what happened. When you go through and you read the story of Abraham, you're reading a testimony of of Abraham's life. The testimonies, and that's what we're going to get to last of all. I'll sort of mention it and then we'll come back to it. But you see, examples, we're taught by example. We're taught by direct statement, but we're also taught by example. And so one of the things that we all learn, for instance, about marriage, God teaches us by example. That's what Christ quoted in uh, Matthew, Matthew 19 and alludes to here. See, the spirit of the law, what's God really after? Is He after just filling out the papers correctly? No, what God really wants. The spirit of the law is you're to be faithful and you're to remain so. And he spells out a very narrow, specific uh, circumstance in which uh, uh, marriage was allowed to be dissolved. Then in verse 33, he says again, You have heard that it has been said by them of old time, You shall not forswear yourself, but you shall perform unto the Lord your oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's His footstool. He says, You've read in the law, and you can go back and you can read it in Leviticus 19.12, Don't forswear yourself. That just means don't perjure yourself. You take an oath, don't commit perjury. Now, Christ said, what do you think that means? You've heard that it was said, don't, per- don't commit perjury. Does that mean that, well, you can go out and lie all the rest of the time? You know, if a guy 
Christ said, look, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. Verse 37. Swear not at all. When, you're, when you swear, what you're doing is you're differentiating between when you tell the truth and when you don't. You're saying, well, you know, the rest of the time you can't believe a word I'm saying. But I got my hand in the air and the other one on the Bible, and I swear by God above, you know, so and so. Well, what do you think is going to happen? God's going to send a lightning bolt down and zap you? You know, how much, what does swearing have to do with telling the truth? Well, I guess uh, you can watch the O.J. trial and you'll find out that it doesn't have a whole lot. I mean, everybody gets on there and tells a different tale, and that's not just that trial, that's any trial. <clears throat> What Christ said, look, the spirit of the law, the law says, the statute says, don't commit perjury. The spirit of the law, the real intent, what God's after is He who wants you to tell the truth. Be honest, be, be upright in what you say, and you really shouldn't ever have to say any more than yes or no, because you're consistently telling the truth all the time. The spirit of the law is truth. You see, the spirit of the law of mur- the spirit of the law that says don't kill is truth. Have love and respect for every human being that draws breath on this planet. The spirit of the law that says don't commit adultery is to be faithful to your mate. The spirit of the law that spells out the, the matter of divorce is the fact that God takes marriage seriously and expects that it be a permanent commitment. The spirit of the law that says don't commit perjury is that you're honest and you tell the truth all the time, every time. Verse 38, you've heard that it was said by them of old time. This is, you've, uh, this is the third of the statutes. You've heard by, that it has been said by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You can go back and you can read that in Exodus 21-24 or Leviticus 24-20, Deuteronomy 19-21. You know what that law had to do? That law had to do with justice with equity. You didn't go out and, and, and exact a major penalty for a minor infraction. You didn't, on the other hand, have a minor penalty for a major infraction. The punishment had to fit, had to fit the crime. You can go back and read it in detail and realize they, they weren't just going through literally gouging eyes out. Uh, that it generally involved fines. It may involve uh, even a public whipping in some cases. It involved making restitution. It was a principle. It was a way of stating, look, let's be fair. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth, not two tooths for one tooth, not a whole mouthful for, for one. Uh, you know, it fits. This is the principle of justice, of fairness. The law spelled out fairness, and God and Christ said, let me ask you something about the principle, the spirit of the law. Let me ask you something. Do you think that the only thing God's after is that we're fair? I'm going to do to him exactly as he did to me. I'm not going to do any more, but I'm going to do what he did to me. I'm going to get even. That's what we say. See, I'm going to get even. Not get one up, but just get even. Even the score. Well, that was spelled out in, in the Old Testament not so much for private vengeance as it was for, for civil law, but people took it as a principle that they applied in, in private vengeance. And Christ said, Look, I'm saying unto you, there's a principle of the law. You see, the, the letter of the law says don't be unfair. Don't take more vengeance on someone than what they did. Is that all that's involved? No, the spirit of the law is that if, you're, if, somebody, if they smite you on your right cheek, you turn the other also. That, you know, if you're compelled to go a mile, you go two. You're prepared to give to him that asks. Didn't say you have to give him exactly what he asks. But the point is, there is a higher principle than fairness, and that is mercy. The spirit of the law that says don't take excess vengeance, the real spirit of the law is have a willingness to suffer if need be. That's what we're told, you know, back in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's just look here briefly. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, or verse 19. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. What glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it you take it patiently, this is acceptable unto God. 
most of us feel like we've done pretty good if we had it coming and we took it in a good attitude. You know, we, we, we get in trouble and we did something, we got ourselves in trouble, we get a chewing, and we sit there and we don't, you know, cuss the guy out or something. And we think, well, you know, I handled that pretty good. I didn't lose my cool. Uh, you know, I was going 90 miles an hour. The policeman stopped me, gave me a ticket, and I, I, I didn't call him any dirty words. I didn't say anything ugly. I just, you know, took it and signed it. Boy, you know, and, and God impressed. Well, Peter says, look, <laughs> you know, what's really impressive to God, what's thankworthy, what God takes note of, is not when you suffer rightfully. And you take it in a decent attitude is when you suffer wrongfully. When you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. See, the blessing is not just if you're persecuted. He didn't say, blessed are you when you're persecuted. You know, you went out and robbed the bank and they arrested you. And oh me, I'm persecuted. You know, but God will bless me, right? No, he says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. You know, when you suffer wrongfully and you take it in a godly attitude. Now, that is hard to do. It's hard enough to take it when you suffer rightfully. None of us like to suffer, see, number one. And if there's anything that goes against our grain, it's unfairness. Unless, of course, we're the ones that come out on top. But, you know, unfairness, if we're the recipients of unfairness, or if a friend of ours is the recipient of unfairness, or sometimes even if we just see somebody and we see them unfairly treated, unfairness goes against the grain, and that's rightly so. It goes against the grain, but you know we have to recognize that the time when real justice with equity, God is the only one who can do that. You have to commit it into the hands of Him that judges righteously. The Spirit of the law of retaliation. The spirit of the law is a willingness to forgive, a willingness to turn the other cheek. Coming on down in verse 43 of Matthew 5, you've heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, the Scripture doesn't say hate your enemy, but Leviticus 19.18 does say you shall love your neighbor. The Jews concluded from that that if they had to love their neighbor, then obviously uh, they could hate their enemy. And they got into great squabbles about who is my neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Is it the guy that lives next door? Or is it the person that lives on your block? Or maybe the person that lives right in your little section, your suburb, right in your city, your state? Who is your neighbor? Well, Christ told the whole story, a whole illustration about that. You remember the story of the, of the, of the Good Samaritan and the whole story was told in answer to the question of who is my neighbor? See, the man had asked Christ, he said, what's the most important thing in the law? And Christ said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And the lawyer said, well, I agree. That's, I, you know, that's right. That's exactly right. But I've got a question for you. Who is my neighbor? And Christ told him the story of the Good Samaritan, and finally he finished up and he said, now who was a neighbor to this fellow? Well, the one that stopped and helped him. I said, go and do likewise. You see, they missed the point. They were so busy arguing about who was their neighbor. Christ said, look, I'm telling you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? Don't even the publicans the same? You know, people in the mafia like their buddies. They like their friends. You salute your brethren only. What do you more than others? Even the publicans do so. Oh, yeah, you know, they say hi to one another. Be you therefore perfect. Be complete. Be mature. Be brought to completion as your Father in heaven is perfect. You see, the spirit of the law is to learn to think like God. That is refers to an attitude of love, an attitude of mercy, an attitude of faithfulness, an attitude of truth, an attitude of commitment. The spirit of the law. The enlivening principle that underlies the statements of the commandments of the statutes. Christ explained the spirit of the law. You know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, we're told here that Speaking of Old Testament Israel, in 1 Corinthians 10.6, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, 
as they also lusted, neither be you idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank, rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day uh, uh, 23,000. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you, as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for examples, and they're written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. You see, the whole point is, the spirit of the law is when you read... Not simply the commandments and the statutes, but the testimonies. When you read the Old Testament, you read the examples, the lives of the men and women with whom God dealt. They were to read it seeking to understand the principle, seeking to understand the spirit of the law. What is the lesson that we should derive? What is the mind of God? Because, brethren, that ultimately is the answer to what is the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is what is the mind of Christ, the mind of God. What's God after? What is it that's really most pleasing to God? You see, there are principles that are given. And the spirit of the law is trying to take and apply those principles. I remember years ago, man, I was in Big Sandy at the feast, and, and I think I was coordinating counseling and anointing. This has probably been, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, close to 20 years ago uh, around there. And I uh, had a man came to me and uh, wanted to counsel someone that I didn't know from a different area. And, and virtually the first question out of his mouth was, I want to know if I'll get kicked out of the church if I do so-and-so. I don't remember all the specifics of what he had in mind to do, but his, his opening question was, I want to know if I'm going to get kicked out of the church if I do thus and such. And I said, let me explain something to you. I said, you've asked the wrong question. That's, that's the wrong question. That's not the question you need to ask. The question you need to be asking is what would God have me do? You see, it's like, well, we'll negotiate. Oh, I'll only be suspended three weeks? Well, that's not too bad. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do it. Six weeks? Well, yeah, I'll think about it. Six months? Well, I don't know. Boy, you're going to kick me out and make some big deal about it? Well, I don't know if it's worth it. It's like, let's negotiate the penalty. How much trouble am I going to get in? We're starting from a self-willed attitude. I've got in mind what I want to do. I'm not really concerned about what does the Scripture say. I want to know what kind of trouble am I going to get into. Is the trouble, you know, is, what I'm, is the pleasure I'm going to derive worth the trouble I'm going to get in? That is not a spirit of the law approach. That is not the spirit of the law. See, that's the, that's the premise that sometimes people operate on, under. You know, you, you could go through, we could, we could spend the rest of, you know, go on and on. I mean, uh, Paul talks about in, in, in uh, uh, first, uh, first Timothy 2.9, he talks about the women adorning themselves with, with modest apparel. Now, let, let's just use this here to illustrate a principle. He didn't go through and spell out exactly how many, you know, what does he mean by that? See, people say, well, you know, what does he mean by that? Back uh, several years back, you know, when the, when, the, when the slits came in, that was the, 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 the thing. Well, you know, you can't point here and show exactly. Paul didn't say how many millimeters. You know, somebody says, well, I want to know, you know, what, a half an inch. Now, that's not much, is it? I mean, you know, some of these things were up so high, it was like every time they walked. Now you see it, now you don't, you know. It just, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, it was... It's about as far from modest as you can get. Or, or you know, some of these little uh, short, tight skirts that uh, you can barely walk in. You don't have to take little mincing steps. Uh, well, you see, how, how, many, how many inches? You know, half an inch. Well, that wouldn't be much of a slip, would it? Well, what about an inch? What about an inch and a half? Well, two inches, you know, two and a quarter. Sort of work your way up. You know, exactly. I want you to draw the line. I want to know exactly where the line is because, you see, I want to do the bare minimum. I don't, want to have, I don't want to get kicked out, but I want to make sure that I'm absolutely not one millimeter more modest than I absolutely have to be to be able to walk in the door and not have my name branded. That is not a spirit of the law approach. See, God is after an attitude, and it will reflect itself in the way we present ourselves. And if you're going to... You know, if you're going down to Padre Island Beach or you're coming into church, the specifics may be different, but the principle is still there. Modesty is something that doesn't call the wrong kind of attention to itself. You see, God deals in principles that are to be internalized, and He gives us specifics. You know, He gives us Ten Commandments, and He gives us illustrations and examples. But 
what God's after is a spirit of the law approach. He's after our learning. What is it God wants us to be? We're to study the Bible not like, you know, the old W.C. Fields movie years ago. You know, W.C. Fields always played these sort of shyster characters, and he was a shyster lawyer. And, and uh, one time the door opens and this guy comes in, W.C. Fields, he's playing the shyster lawyer. He's sitting back behind his desk and he's reading the Bible. And the guy that opens the door looks in, boy, he's, he's flabbergasted. He says, why, W.C., he says, you're reading the Bible. What are you doing that for? You see, Fields looks up and says, looking for loopholes, looking for loopholes. <laughs> that was why he was reading the Bible. He was looking for loopholes. That's the way sometimes people look, uh, want to read is they're, they're looking to see what can they get by with, what can they maneuver through. Well, God doesn't want us reading the Bible to look for loopholes. He wants us to read the Bible to look to understand the mind of God. See, the question we need to ask ourselves is, what is it that would be most pleasing to God? Not is it, not, well, what are they going to do to me if I get caught? What would God have me do? What would Christ do? What is the most Christ-like thing? And so we read the Scriptures. We don't just use our imagination to just sort of imagine what Christ would do. We read the examples and the illustrations. We read what the law says. But we're after the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law does not spiritualize away the law. It doesn't minimize the law. It maximizes the law. It maximizes the law. And we learn to keep it in the spirit and the intent Let's close here in Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He said, I want you to present yourselves a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. This is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. Don't, be fit, don't fit in with, don't take your shape, your identity. Don't derive who and what you are from the world around you. Don't blend in to be part and parcel of this society. Don't derive your identity from this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. A new way of thinking. Renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Brethren, that's the spirit of the law. Not to derive our identity, not to derive who and what we are from trying to fit in with this world and just be like and fit in with and just reflect uh, worldly attitudes and worldly behavior and, 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 and a worldly approach. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. The only way we're going to be transformed is to, by a renewing of our mind, having a new way of thinking, having the mind of Christ in us as a replacement of the carnal mind. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that you may know and know that you know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is the mind of God that mind of God, that perfect will of God. That, brethren, is the spirit of the law. The Protestants in the Catholic world do not understand the spirit of the law. They think the law is spiritualized away. The Jews don't understand the spirit of the law. They think just, just observing the letter is enough. Christ came and magnified the law. He didn't minimize it, didn't spiritualize it away. He magnified it to the full scope of the intent. The spirit of the law goes way beyond the letter. It involves coming to understand the fullness of that perfect and complete will of God. As Peter said, Be you therefore holy as your Father in heaven is holy.